I went out with my sister to a 15th Street Fisheries, and I met a captain that um, I went to work with for a very long time, Austin Scott, they called him Scotty. Scotty said, hey, listen, you know, you speak some languages and you like to cook and you know how to sail. I'm running a boat called Lord Jim, and we're gonna do a cruise around the world. Would you like to come with us? Hey, everybody, we are here for another episode of Boating Insider, and this is Rhiannon, CRO over at Vessel Vanguard. And today, I am with Norma Treese, and she holds many hats and is a empire in the maritime industry. Uh, she is CEO of Yacht Knowledge. She is board member of the International Sea Keepers Society, and she's a board member of the International Super Yacht Society, plus many, many more. But she has a wealth of industry knowledge and passion, and that's really what we're going to dive into today is where did she come up within the industry? What are her experiences? What is she doing now? And we're really just going to have a great fun conversation surrounded by her because she has all of it. So welcome, everybody. This is Norma. Great to meet you, Rianne, and thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I'm really happy that we're here. Took a little bit for us to get here, but we made it happen. So. Hey, that's okay. You know, there's, uh, you know, uh, different wave heights and everything you do in life. So sometimes the voyage takes longer than others. There we go. <laughs> All right, so let's kick it off. So you and I spoke a couple weeks ago, because it's been almost like a month ago, I think, at this time. Um, but we started just to get to know each other a little bit. And then I just kind of sat back and was wowed by all the life that you've experienced in this incredible industry. So I would definitely want to start out with, tell us about you. How did you get started in the marine industry? Um, some of the, the fun adventures that you had as you got started and what has brought you up to this point now? You know, I've been really lucky. Um, it's funny, both of my parents were in the U.S. Navy in World War II. So I think in some way, I was actually born to this maritime life, although neither one of them ever pursued it. Um, but um, I, we moved back to the United States after I was um, raised in Paris, so um, a very fantastic experience. And my best friend's dad had an Alberg dealership, even though he was a high school principal as his main job. And um, they invited me to go sailing one weekend, and I fell absolutely in love with it. And I kept on sailing with them all through my high school years and uh, did a lot of work with them. And that was a wonderful experience. It taught me a lot about not only sailing, uh, but being aboard, entertaining guests, and actually selling yachts, which um, is really the only thing that I've never done in yachting. I've done just about everything else. Um, <laughs> so, you know, starting out very young, um, it was love for me, love yeah. of the sea and love of the lifestyle and, um, you know, just enjoyment, which is such an important part of everything having to do with yachting in particular, because if you don't enjoy it, then what's the point? What are you doing? Yeah. And um, after I finished college, I decided that I was, I came down to Fort Lauderdale for a job and I got fired the last time I ever got fired in my life by a um, the misogynistic F&B <laughs> F director at a hotel in Fort Lauderdale. And I went out with my sister. I've told this story a lot. Oh my goodness. And um, I went out with my sister to a 15th Street Fisheries where they had uh, 25 cent drink nights. And let me tell you, those drinks, they were terrible. You know, I, I don't remember the names of too many of them, but you know, things like yellow birds and yeah. so on. But anyway, we probably had a couple of those. And I met a captain that um, I went to work with for a very long time. His name was uh, Austin Scott. They called him Scotty. Okay. And um, Scotty said, hey, listen, you know, you speak some languages and you like to cook and you know how to sail. Um, I'm running a boat called Lord Jim, very spark, very famous uh, Sparkman and Stevens sailboat. And uh, we're going to do a cruise around the world. Would you like to come with us? How old are you at this time? Oh, gosh, I was, you know, probably 23, something like that. It was just after college. Wow. And um, so... Uh, I didn't know that the very first thing we were going to have to do was actually take apart the entire rigging of the sailboat and lay it out on the tarmac um, at Director Shipyard, which is just around the corner here. And so my sister is an architect, and she taught me how to do the, you know, the little drawings to make sure we did absolutely everything correctly so we could put it back together once we'd taken it apart. Wow. Um, so that was a very interesting beginning, but um, that's okay because, you know, the technical aspect of yachting is really just as important yeah. as the hospitality. So um, at the end of the day, um, I only did a little bit of cruising with Lord Jim because um, the captain had also hired uh, another young lady named uh, Debbie. And um, 
he kind of had to choose between the two of us, and it's a good thing he chose her because they ended up uh, being married for 25 years. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I love that. And, uh, and I went on to my yachting career, and um, I spent about 10 years working as a, as a charter chef. Uh, I worked on motor yachts and sailboats um, in the Caribbean, in the Mediterranean. That was kind of unusual back in those days. And um, I just had a great time and, um, you know, worked with a lot of captains and crew that I'm still really good friends with. Um, that was based out of here, out of Fort Lauderdale? I, I was always based in Fort Lauderdale. My uh, younger sister and I bought a house together. And so that was something that was really important to have, you know, a home base and not, not only be living out of my duffel bag. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and, and still today, that's something I think is a really positive influence on any yacht crew. Um, but after those 10 years, um, which I tell you, I, I enjoyed to the maximus. I got to know a million people. I decided it was time for me to come home to Fort Lauderdale because uh, what I really missed in all my years of having, you know, captain boyfriends, you know, and, and <laughs> one in every port, so to speak, um, I really wanted a long-term boyfriend because that was something that I'd always done. So I said, you know, I've, I need to settle down a little bit. At that point, I was, you know, getting ready to turn 30 before too long and, you know, re really, you know, felt the, felt the need for love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I started not knowing anything else, but knowing that I knew the yachting community, um, I just started, decided to start my own crew agency. So okay. I, I started a company on 17th Street here in Fort Lauderdale. I, I rented an office and Fortunately, I didn't know what I didn't know. I, I had $21,000 $21, saved um, from my yachting career. And I thought I was, you know, rich. Yeah. And I had plenty of investment. <laughs> As I said, thank goodness I didn't know what I was lacking in business experience or in setting up a business. Um, but it worked really well because I ran and owned that company for um, over 12 years. And I had, um, I sold it to Fraser Yachts. Um, which was the very first of the service businesses to sell, which started kind of a, a trend and what's become in recent years a tsunami of um, yachting businesses um, being sold and traded. And it's been a very, very interesting thing to watch. Um, oh, I bet. Yeah. That, so that. I'll back you up for a second, though. So you were a, char you were a chef on charters. I was, I, I was a charter chef, charter. which means that you work full-time on a yacht and you're part of basically the marketing team. So one of the things, you know, a yacht is a yacht, but what really makes a yacht special is the crew aboard. Yeah. And so I worked with a lot of really fantastic captains. Um, one of them that I, I spent almost two years with was uh, a 47-footer named Finesse, a guy <laughs> named, great guy named uh, David Kramer. Loved him. Um, I worked with uh, someone that, whose name you may not, you may know, um, she's become a, a super important and very successful yacht broker, Can Captain Annie Avery. Okay. And uh, that was on a Kemper and Nicholson, a 60-footer. And we were basically the only all-female charter team in the Caribbean. Oh, wow. And um, she and I are still very close friends. I just had uh, coffee with her last week. And um, it's amazing how many people from those days, this is going back almost 30 years now, from the very beginning, how many of those people are still in the industry? It's not just me. That's of course, cool. many have fallen by the wayside. Unfortunately, many of, uh, many of them have left us. And a lot of them have gone into the business of yachting, which is what I That's do. really neat to see. So were you a chef before you started taking that on? Or did you just like to cook? That seems like a big endeavor. Was it fall under the, I didn't know what I didn't know, and I liked it, and I went after it? Well, um, I grew up in a diplomatic family, and um, we— a big part of my father's job was to entertain people. Mm. Um, when I was growing up in Paris, we had the most beautiful home. It was four stories up and two stories oh, wow. down. And it had this, you know, humongous marble dining table and chandeliers. Oh. It, was, it, was, it was phenomenal. It was really like growing up in a, um, you know, a, a playground of beautiful things. Oh, yeah. Um, but as and I I'm said, sure the, the, the dress is going to dinner. Well, not me so much, but, you know, my, my mom and my older yeah. sister and brother. But... Um, we had to entertain a lot. So we had dinner parties and we had cocktail parties. And I just love that. I've always been a very social person. So um, I remember at one point I said to my mom, I said, oh, mom, you know, can I please, please stay up, you know, to, you know, it, it, you know, see everybody at the party and everything. And my father said, 
um, I want to teach you something. If you want to come and be a part of this, I need to teach you something that's very important for my work and I think could be important for you and has subsequently become something that is one of my trademarks. He said, um, if you come to the party, you have to go up to everyone and you have to introduce yourself and say, uh, I'm Norma Treese, I'm Dr. and Mrs. Treese's daughter. You know, bienvenue chez nous, welcome to our house. And then when it's time for you to go to bed, you have to go back to every single person that you've spoken to and say, say thank night. you very much, bonne nuit, good night, and call them by name. Oh, yeah. And that is your job. And that taught me something which is a very small skill, but something which is really, really important and has helped me so much in my career. And that is that I'm really good at remembering people's names. That's incredible. So I go up to them at boat shows. People are always saying to me, I cannot believe I haven't seen you in how many years yeah. that you still remember my name. And one of my old bosses, the fantastic Colin Squire at Yachting Matters magazine, um, said to me, he said, Norma doesn't just know everybody's name. She knows their kids, their dogs, yep. their family, everything. So thanks, Dad. That's incredible. I mean, there's there's so many life lessons that, as you were saying, I was like, that's a br that's brilliant. I mean, I try to take my kids to restaurants and ensure that they look the server in the eye and that they order their food and that they say the please and the thank yous. That is a very small comparison to just that life lesson of be present when you're with somebody, look them in the eye, get to know that person. I mean, that's that transfers and remember up. their name and remember their name, and then for the rest of your time engaging, you've you've made that person feel heard and. You are a front and center. That's incredible. It, it, as I, and I can see how it's translated into your career. It's a very small skill, but it comes in handy, especially yeah. when you know as many thousands of people <laughs> yes. as I do. You know, they say in the world that you can only have about 500 friends. I mean, that might be true for the general population, but it's certainly not for me. You said, hold my beer. <laughs> I'm not much of a beer. I, I, drink, I drink beer when I'm in Germany with my husband, but I'm okay. not too fond of it. But... Um, I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's part of what the yachting industry has offered me and yeah. the rest of my hobbies. Um, but I literally feel really close with many thousands of people. That's and incredible. and that's, that's just an absolutely beautiful thing. It is. But, you know, you talked about um, learning life lessons. And, you know, I, I think I told you my main business interests have always been anything related to yacht crew. And so I'm in a position... Um, you know, whether I'm placing them aboard a yacht or whether I'm educating them at a conference or something. Uh, one of the things that's so important for yacht crew is also might seem evident, but it's not. And that is what the French call les politesses de la vie, manners. So you need to learn to um, eat properly, use a knife and fork, um, brush your teeth, say good morning, say good night be polite and considerate of others at all times because that's not something that's just important in life. But let me tell you, one place where it's even more important is in cruise quarters. I can imagine. So let's I want to dive into your crew experience, your crew passion. So obviously being on the charters, it sounds like you were involved in a lot of different roles on these yachts through all the years. So you decide that you want to settle down a little bit and you come by and you have, you're 21000 and you're going to invest into a business for crew. Well, I'll start my own business. Start your own business. Crew network, yes. As I said, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, but it turned out great because at that point, we didn't have, um, you know, literally when we started the business, we had to choose whether we were going to have a, a telex machine or what kind of communication we were going to have instead of a telephone. Wow. Cell phones were only just starting. So we decided not to get the telex machine. But at the beginning, we actually sent out CVs by FedEx. And, oh, FedEx. Wow. and FedEx was expensive back then. When we got our first fax machine, let me tell you, that was heaven on earth. It was <laughs> such an incredibly um, helpful tool. Oh, I can imagine. And, and as we grew the business, one of the things I was very fortunate, I hired a really smart young lady um, who introduced me to that other really fantastic tool, which was email. And we started the very first online database for Yacht Crew. Wow. And that's one of the things that really helped me develop into many offices in several different countries because we could actually communicate and all of us work with the same um, information base. And of course, nowadays, that sounds 
you know, simple and automatic. Yeah. But let me tell you, that made a big difference um, for us. That was a differentiator. And I'm quite sure that that's one of the reasons why um, Fraser Yachts pinpointed me and Crew Network um, as a target for acquisition. Um, And of course, since then, it's become, you know, very, very handy. And, you know, so um, I'm a little more tech savvy than, you know, maybe... (laughs) You know, now that I've entered into the, you know, the the elderly statesman of this world <laughs> status, um, it, I'm still very involved in technology and I love to see it grow. And of course, technology is one of the cornerstones, the most important pillars of any yacht, yacht operation, build, all of those things. Yes. Imagine if you had full control of your boat, you felt safer eliminated the unknown, and you were able to forecast and plan for your boat's upcoming maintenance instead of being caught off guard. Can you imagine knowing exactly what is installed on your boat down to the part and serial number on all of your standard and custom equipment at a moment's notice? Having instant access to your manuals while at dock or at sea and provide custom departure checklists specifically for your boat and your crew. Imagine ensuring the safety of your vessels and passengers with instant access to send emergency alerts and being able to ensure the value and the pedigree of your boat with digital logs recording the full history of every event on your boat. Well, you can with Vessel Vanguard. We are the leading maintenance and safety management software in the marine industry. We work with a wide range of marine industry experts, including yacht owners, captains, ferry and tugboat operators. If you're looking to safeguard your assets and preserve your revenue, visit VesselVanguard.com and schedule a demonstration for yourself. The link can be found in the show notes below. We look forward to supporting you and your vessel soon. For sure. Tell me a little bit about, so the crew, the crew experience, but having a passion for it. So what what does that mean? Where did that drive you? Because obviously there was a business opportunity and you knew that was there. But you, one of the things you stated, and I want to make sure I quote it, is crew is the greatest expense, but it's also the number one reason why owners leave the industry. It absolutely is. Um, you know, so less during the years that I own Crew Network because, you know, frankly, I was I, I was pretty focused on running and growing my business back in those days. Mm-hmm. The way I did that was by participating in yacht shows, um, by participating in educational conferences. I started writing for yachting magazines because I couldn't afford advertising. So that was, you know, we all know that, um, you know, editorial is a lot more valuable than advertorial. Yeah. And, um, you know, that helped also jumpstart my very long um, and uh, incredibly vibrant uh, yacht journalism career. And, um, but when I went into the business end of yachting. As I said, I, after I sold Crew Network, um, I helped launch a magazine called Doc Walk. I helped sell mm. that. So, you know, kind of you're seeing some trends. Yeah. Um, I worked for Yacht Report magazine. I started Crew Report for them. Uh, I worked for Boat International on a magazine that was called Captain's Log. And, um, you know, helping spread the word. And a big part of what I've always been able to do is is communicate with everybody from deckhands all the way up to owners and yacht builders. And as the industry has grown, along with my old career, it's really mirrored the growth of the large yacht industry. My specialty is only yachts that have professional crew. So 35 meters and above is what we generally call that. So um, over 100 feet above. And I started looking at it from more of a global point of view. And it's absolutely true that after you build a yacht, the number one greatest expense on your bottom line in operation is your crew salaries. Your crew expenses in general, because it's a lot more than just what you pay Just salaries. You have to feed them, you have to clothe them, you have to send them back home, you have to give them insurance, or at least you should if you have a proper operation. Mm. It's also, unfortunately, crew after being the number one expense is also the number one frustration for every yacht owner. It's incredible to think that still this day, we have over 50% turnover on your average yacht and crew. Why is that? It's a very difficult thing to work on a yacht. It's what I call dehumanizing. Um, Not only are you um, living in a very small cabin, you're probably sharing it with somebody else, um, but you're you're living in somebody else's direction. You wear the clothes that they tell you to wear. You eat the food they tell you to eat. You're only allowed to take your off time 
at the discretion of the vessel, your captain, in today's world, increasingly your management. Mm -hmm. So that means that a lot of times you have to miss important events, whether it's Christmas, whether it's a wedding, whether it's unfortunately things like funerals, Mm -hmm. because you simply are not able to um, direct your own life. And that's something that is very subtle and yet very real because you're there, you're in a concentrated atmosphere, you are giving up part of your identity, and yet you're having to work in extremely close proximity and a high level of teamwork with a lot of other people. So it requires, you know, people think, oh, it's so much fun to go work on a yacht, but the reality is you better have a strong constitution or you're probably not going to make it. Wow. You hear about some of the turnover, but I've never really dove into, like, where does that come from, the wear and tear? And it's just, you become a part of the yacht itself, and the yacht is mechanical, and it's got to do what it's got to do. You become a part of that. We, the dehumanizing is a really interesting aspect of it. It's, it's absolutely real. Wow. And that's not the only reason, of course. Sure. That, that you know, we have a lot of turnover. Um, if you're going to work on a yacht, you know, you have to have a certain ability to say, I give myself up for this and I am able to uh, not deal with, you know, the things that normal people have. Yeah. Um, A house, expenses, family, as I said before. Yeah. Love life can be very, very complicated. Yeah. And that's something that's difficult for people to do. And there's not a lot of training for that. If you're going to go work on a yacht— You have to have, you have to start out with STCW, which is your basic um, safety at sea training. Um, If you're going to work in the interior, you have to have ENG, which is basically hygiene. Mm. If you're going to be an engineer or a captain or a deckhand, if you're going to climb up the ladder of command or into a position as a head of department, there is an unceasing list of qualifications and training that you have to have. But it's very difficult to train people to be able to get along mm-hmm. in have the quarters, emotional bandwidth aboard. to deal yeah, with to it. Have, to have the emotional bandwidth or to be able to close off the emotional bandwidth yeah. enough to be able to handle it. That's so those are a lot of the reasons why we have so much turnover. Um, and of course, in today's world, we have the ever-present below deck effect. I was just going to say the exact same thing. Is that Are you seeing that ripple through... The industry of it's kind of put some glitz and glam around it, and I mean, how how serious are young career people in the yachting industry taking? They said some of these certifications and these trainings, or they're just like, I want to do this. It looks fun and makes it look like I'm going to get my time in the limelight. Well, you know, I have to be perfectly honest because I am the real Norma <laughs> from <laughs> below deck Mediterranean. Captain Sandy Yon has been yep. one of my best friends for years. Uh, she calls me AskNorma.com. So when she has questions about whatever it might be, whether it's, you know, the best place to have dinner during the Monaco Yacht Show, or whether it's a question of where, you know, she might do or something she can do with her crew. Um, if you watch the show, you've seen that she calls up and she says, Norma, I need some help. That's actually production, to be honest with you. <laughs> The secret's out. <laughs> I that's love okay. It. Everybody knows that the real Norma does exist, but it's just not the one that's on the TV. <laughs> exactly. they, don't, they never film me. They only, they only use my name, but that's okay because <laughs> okay. I love it. I love Sandy. I've supported her for years. Um, that's a really interesting story how I met her. I met her at the Monaco Yacht Show about 25 years ago when she had just had an, an absolutely incredible experience. The vessel she was running called White Star. She worked for a famous, uh, very high-level uh, Saudi Arabian prince. And they, in coming back um, through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, um, they had a fire in the engine room, and that caused a dead ship. And unfortunately, this was during Ramadan. And they were stuck hiding behind an island for almost a week Oh, my goodness. Before a U.S. Uh, naval ship was able to come and rescue them. So Sandy Yon, using her true-to-life, fantastic leadership skills, was able to keep everybody calm and motivated, um, even when they hide, had to hide from potential pirates. I mean, it was a fantastic wow. story. So I wrote a story about her, and Sandy always says that I was the one that made her famous. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, it's a it's a question of of the student far outstripping the teacher because we all know the phenomenon wow. that the fabulous Captain Sandy Yon has become. Yes. And I'm really proud of her. I love her. I love what she does. In fact, I know all of the captains on all of the um different franchises of Below Deck. That's incredible. Yes, it, which is which is a wonderful thing. And and all of them are absolutely great. I'm I'm currently watching Below Deck Down Under, which has the best B-roll ever. Okay. And, that, and you know, <laughs> including Captain Jason Chambers, let's face it. He's pretty dishy. I saw the one episode with Captain Sandy. I think, in that, forgive me because I haven't watched all of them, but the one where she had to relieve the other captain because he was having issues. Oh, with yeah. The- that's that's actually on uh, Below Deck. Where that's Captain Lee's franchise. Okay. Yes. And Captain Lee had some... Um, a personal issues, some yes. health issues, and he had to go home to Fort Lauderdale. He lives right around the corner from me. Does he really? Yeah. That's fantastic. And um, and so she came, and she did her usual great job there. Um, It was a little bit difficult, you know, of course. I can imagine. Um, I watched her go through that. I thought, ooh, like coming in somebody else's crew midway through charter season, and then the one episode where somebody, you know, didn't give her the captain recognition, and she was like, I'm sorry, you have to go. And I thought, yes, girl. Yes, girl. Captain Sandy is the real deal. Yeah. She started Respect. out um, her career, you know, being from actually a uh, horse country in okay. the boonies of Florida. And she went to go work uh, for a company that was washing down boats. And she met an absolutely fantastic yacht owner, Mr. Flynn, who I know personally and I've done business with too. And he saw the potential in Captain Sandy on. And he invited her to join his crew. And she ended up becoming the captain on that boat, helping him build a couple of boats. That was White Star, the same one. Wow. The story I the just told you. The same one you just told you. me. Okay. And they're still extremely good friends, and he's very supportive of her. And as I said, you know, he's a fantastic human being, and she is too. And he recognized that. And that's not something that we see enough in, of, in our industry. You know, you were asking me about turnover and... Yeah. and why we have such a high level of turnover in the yacht business with the crew. And a lot of that is also because people don't realize the fact that there are long-term career opportunities in yachting. That's a great message. You, you, know, can, you can either keep on working on yachts long-term and build it the way Captain Sandy has done. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm telling you, her add-on career from below deck is just amazing, and we've all been able to see that. You can go ashore and get into the business end of yachting, as I did. And I'm telling you, the business end of yachting is at least as much fun as the onboard end. (laughs) And there's so many different opportunities you can have. So a really important message for yacht crew is that you don't have to give up the time that you've spent building a solid yachting career aboard. You can develop very long-term career opportunities. And there are actually more, statistically, more jobs in the business of yachting than there are aboard. So that's something I really like to emphasize with Absolutely. Crew. You know, the life after yachting can be yachting. And I'm saying should be yachting because from my point of view, there's not much better than staying in the yacht business. <laughs> I love it. So one thing, when you were talking about Captain Sandy just now, and you said, you know, she met uh, Flynn. Was, is it Captain Flynn? No, uh, Mr. Flynn, Mr. John Flynn. Flynn. And then you are a mentor in this industry in a lot of different ways. And we just spoke about somebody that you're going to meet up in Monaco and really take the time and invest time, emotion, uh, knowledge, everything just to help this individual. And then we met with Captain Wendy Clark about a month or two ago over in Tampa. But she talked very passionately about she would not be where she is if she didn't have strong mentors and she said mentorship is just so important in, in this industry. So do you have anything that you experience in that or any thoughts around that? Well, you know, that kind of goes back to the way in which I accidentally built my yacht business career. Um, when I started um, Crew Network, uh, in addition to writing for yachting magazines, I started joining associations. The first one I joined was the International Super Yacht Society at the that very the beginning. One? Almost 30 years ago. So I've been a part of it. Wow, I didn't realize that. I've been a board member for over 20 years. I'm a board member emeritus now. And um, I do two main things for Super Yacht Society. I helped create the Distinguished Crew Awards, um, which was the very first of the People Awards that we have at the Super Yacht Society. Now we have Business Person of the Year. We have Excellence in Innovation. We have the Leadership Award, many, many 
but I'm so proud of the Distinguished Crew Awards. And we're here in the FedShip office, and I want to tell you that uh, Ted McCumber, Captain Ted McCumber, we call him Ted Ship, is one of my judges for the Distinguished Crew Awards, and oh, really? I can't think of anybody better. And um, stay tuned to that page because I can't tell you who they are, but the winners this year are just amazing. Okay. The story is fantastic. A very large crew okay. that participated in heroic deeds that are really worth talking about. I got the invite, I believe, because that's the leadership uh, during FLIBS. Is that the event? That's, that is the um, uh, Super Yacht Society Awards Leadership Gala. Okay. Which I think is I going to be that. at the Ritz Carlton. Yes. And the other thing I do for Super Yacht Society is um, I'm very involved in our educational outreach. So, for instance, in Monaco this year, um, the leadership series, we call that. In um, Monaco, I am helping organize and participating in two seminars. Okay. Uh, both of them held at the Yacht Club of Monaco on the first day of the show. And uh, the first one is called Smart Bridges, Now to Next Navigation. And that is geared towards captain and crew and people that are interested in the technology aspect of yachting because... You know, just like everything else, technology at, in the wheelhouse mm -hmm. is hugely important. And it's very interesting and almost distressing that to get a captain's license today, um, you are actually not required to pass celestial navigation anymore. Wow. When I got my captain's license, celestial navigation was one of the most difficult parts, let me tell you. And no matter how fantastic your electronic navigation is, Ectus is a big part of that. It's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a really large yep. shift. You probably know you're in the technology yep. world yourself. Yep. And um, so that's a captain and crew, smart bridges from one to three at the end. Oh, I know. I saw that. I thought that if there's ever been a seminar that caught my attention, I was like, well, I hope you'll attend. The second one is super interesting. And that goes back to the roots of the Super Yacht Society. Okay. Um, that's called the rising tides of mergers and acquisitions in yachting. What my company started with a service building business being able to be sold almost 15 years ago has now turned into the biggest wave of mergers, acquisitions, consolidation of businesses. So as Super Yacht Society, and I've got an incredible panel of speakers, uh, Bob Saxon, the famous Bob Saxon that we all him. love, is chairing <laughs> it for me. Um, he's going to be on the panel, and I'm going to be out in the audience. And we're hoping to have that entire room full of people that are interested or have participated themselves in mergers and acquisitions and consolidations. Wow. Needless to say, one of the headliners on the panel has to be the big gorilla in the business, mm. which is Marie e Max. <laughs> It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, well. Super Yacht Society represents the business of yachting. So for us, wow. this is really, really important. And that'll be followed, of course, by, you know, you can't have a yacht show. You can't have an educational event if you don't have some really fun networking. So we're going to have um, our hugely popular members reception um, from six to eight on the pool deck um, at the Yacht Club of Monaco. And that will bring together what is possibly the most important and largest group of very powerful business people, crew leaders in the industry. And the view from up there, uh, girl, <laughs> can't be beat. <laughs> okay. We'll have to paint that picture. We'll have to take a screenshot and like, like this is what they're looking at. All right. So Super Yacht Society, let's talk about Sea Keepers because we had just met with the, the team, Tony and Tony from Sea Keepers a couple weeks ago. Um, lots of views, lots of shares. People are very interested in what's happening with Sea Keepers. Can you tell us your involvement? What's behind it? Why are you involved with it? Kind of give me that rundown. Well, um, you know, just like everything else in the yachting business and in my life, it's a story of longevity. Um, in my personal life, I've been very happily married for 26 years to the most wonderful guy, a classical musician named Detlef. Um, I've traveled the world with him for his career, going to opera houses and concert halls. Oh gosh. And um, I became a part of uh, Sea Keepers when it was founded in Monaco 25 years ago. We're having our 25th anniversary this year. Oh, are you going to celebrate in Monaco? Well, we're going to celebrate here in Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Um, that event was called the Bal de la Mer. It was a weekend long. 
And I happened to be invited, and little did I know that 25 years later, um, after volunteering with them, participating in events with, with sea keepers all over the world, um, that I would be deeply honored um, to be asked to join the board of directors. Uh, there's only six of us on the board of sea keepers, wow. um, including uh, Julian Chang, who runs um, Super Yacht Society Asia, and um, the fabulous uh, Michael Moore, who's been, you know, so important in the growth of um, super yachts, I mean, excuse me, sea keepers throughout all the years. And um, what we do, as you know, um, with uh, Sea Keepers Society is uh, we are involved um, in harnessing the power of our yachting community in a variety of ways um, to help save our ocean. So we do, um, we're involved in um, restoration, conservation, education, anything to do with bettering the playground that we yeah, all the benefit playground. from. Absolutely. And we work with yacht owners. We have a discovery fleet of over 200 vessels that travel around the world, um, gathering data, doing projects, sending back information. Um, we're part of the Seabed 2030 program, which is a global crowdsourcing group that involves all aspects of the maritime industry um, from, uh, you know, the, the most important uh, educational um, academic groups to commercial vessels to cruise ships. And we currently have um, 56 uh, data loggers on Seakeeper's wow. vessels. Um, over the years, we've accomplished over 200 um, scientific studies of varying different types. And again, I know you've learned a lot about that yeah. from Tony and Tony. And we involve um, our community, whether it's the citizen scientists that do things like uh, clean up beaches and, yeah. and shark tagging and a variety of different things. Um, they can, they can um, uh, take along um, drifters behind their vessels and, and gather information, um, or um, whether it's larger scale projects like um, Seabed 2030 and other scientific um, endeavors that we're associated with. Um, in Monaco, we are also for sea keepers uh, participating in uh, a seminar on sustainability at the, the beautiful and famous uh, Musée Oceanographique uh, in Monaco. And um, we're also hosting a sea keepers ocean science roundtable um, where we are convening a number of global experts to discuss ways in which we can wow. come up with new scientific projects that sea keepers and the other people that are participating with us, including the IHO, which is the International Hydrographic Organization, the Institut Scientifique, which is based in Monaco, and um, see what else we can do. And I promise you, we'll be bringing those ideas back to our sea keepers population. That sounds incredibly exciting. It I is exciting. I just envision these great minds sitting around and talking about what can we do to protect our mother ocean and make her even better for all the reasons to play, right? Absolutely. I love it. And um, it's, it's really thrilling as a member of a small and powerful board to be able to help those things happen. Um, Michael Moore tells me I have a very fertile mind, and I'm always coming up with new ideas of things that we can do as sea keepers, as Super Yacht Society. I'm involved with uh, Yachty Global. I spent uh, nine years on the governing council of the Professional Yachting Association based out of Antibes. And uh, I speak at conferences worldwide. And it's very important to me to give back to the industry and to help the yachting industry spread the word of how fantastic yachting is. We're not just dirty polluters and toys of the ultra-rich. Excuse me. <laughs> yachting contributes an unbelievable degree of good things to the world. Um, we are at the forefront of innovation. We're at the forefront of technological development. We're at the forefront of bringing um, art and joy aboard. We are an incredibly important source of new revenue in the world, and we create business opportunities in the 25 yeah. plus years I've been involved in the business end of yachting, the amount of businesses that have grown around the large yacht industry is infinitely larger than the amount of vessels, than all these beautiful fed ships that you see represented behind me. The yachting industry is an opportunity still to this day because 
in order to really remain in the position where we are to offer the ultimate luxury item to the hyper-wealthy, we have to maintain our position at the forefront of the development of art, technology, joy, and that creates business opportunities. So that goes back to what I was saying about crew. Incredible to see today the amount of crew started businesses. It is such a joy to hear about and to witness what people are doing today, starting from their crew background, just like myself, very modest back in those days. Nowadays, of course, the yachts are bigger. The amount of crew is bigger. Mm. But the business opportunities also continue to grow. So that's back to life after yachting. Please stay in yachting. I love it. I love it. So I have so many bullet points. I could talk to you forever about my brain went in so many different ways. Um, But I want to come back to you and where you are now in your career. You obviously have Monaco coming up. And then you'll have Flibs. Are you, are you holding any seminars at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show? Always. Okay. Always doing outreach in every single way. Okay. Um, you know, I have to say, I want to give a shout out to my great friends at FedShip, Federation of Shipbuilders based out of Holland. Um, the, if not one of the absolutely most respected, highest quality yacht builders in the world. And they also helped me start my career. I worked on several Fed ships. Uh, the longest lasted uh, yacht job I ever had was on a fed ship called Avante for a wonderful American owner. I met my best friend there, who's still my best friend in this world, <laughs> fabulous Australian uh, uh, chica, uh, Colleen Page. Um, and when um, I started, after I sold Crew Network and was working on magazines, I had already been working with FedShip as part of their crew education programs. Um, we called it uh, the Meeting of the Minds. And um, I was helping them, and we were coming up with some new ideas of different things. FedShip has had a fantastic history of outreach and respect and working together with their crew. Amazing. Not just TedShip that now runs FedShip USA. <laughs> um, but I was uh, doing some um, site sourcing with Hein Velema, that was their director of sales at the time, driving him around the French Riviera, you know, going to Nice and places, you know, this hotel, that hotel, you know, this golf course, you know, where can we hold? What at that point um, we were um, calling the crew challenge. We wanted to do an interactive, you know, uh, athletic and um, academic and educational event. And he turned around to me at at one point and said, you know, Norma, we love you and we thank you for volunteering for us all these years. It's been great. But, um, you know, we'd actually really be willing to pay you for what you do for us. He said, that's called consulting. All right. So let me tell you, FedShip has been fantastic for my career in many ways, because ever since then, I've had a really long and vibrant career doing consulting. I've worked for just about every sector across yachting, from um, remote telemedicine um, to uh, building um, one of the most fantastic superyacht marinas in Barcelona. I worked for Salamanca Group for six years, building Marina Port Vale and uh, learning. I learned how to spend millions and sell millions, Mm -hmm. is what I've always said and um, many other businesses, BWA. Um, and I'm now a consultant with uh, Dryad Global, which is a fantastic technology company. Yeah. And um, in fact, uh, you know, all of these things are all intertwined. You know, yachting is a very close, intimate circle. And so a lot of those people in my businesses are ones that I will call upon um, to participate, sponsor, um, you know, promote, um, our educational opportunities. So uh, besides Monaco, um, you asked me what we're doing at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show. Uh, Super Yacht Society is um, holding seminars there. We have our, our morning breakfast every year. Mm-hmm. And um, Thursday during the show, we work together with Mare Forum, which is a very well-known European-based um, education maritime business. And we've worked together with them for many years. So we'll have a variety of interesting topics in the morning with uh, Mari Forum and in the afternoon with Super Yacht Society. And um, again, for that uh, working together aspect, mm-hmm. um, Super Yacht Society, in addition to recognizing crew excellence with the Distinguished Crew Awards, always makes sure that we have topics that are relevant and of interest to the captain and crew population, including our great friend, Captain Kelly, Captain Gordon. Kelly Gordon, <laughs> and, I'm, and I, I work with her as well. I always want to support her in everything Absolutely. she does. 
Um, I was the microphone girl for her in her fantastic seminar she did um, at the West Palm Beach show. And uh, I'm sure that she'll be calling on me in Monaco. And so, you know, it's an equal opportunity um, uh, support system. Yeah. She supports what we do at Super Yacht Society. In fact, she's on the education committee. Oh, good. And we support her in everything that she does. Absolutely. That's fantastic. So I think a combination of mentorship keeps popping up in these discussions. And then there's the other side of it, which is awareness of some of the opportunities where you can make a huge impact, whether that's from an environmental standpoint or um, maybe a collective uh, educational standpoint. Um, Action and then awareness, I believe, is what we heard from the the Sea Keeper team is like, find this awareness, be aware of what's going on around you and in this industry, and then take action on where you can. Well, absolutely. As the French would say, it's action, réaction. (laughs) Action, reaction. And that's absolutely true in everything in life. And uh, you mentioned mentorship. That's one of my favorite words and one of my favorite activities as well. Um, I've been involved for many years with that fantastic organization, uh, Young Professionals of Yachting, YPY. And um, I'm actually an an honorary member of YPY because by the time they founded it, I had already aged out. (laughs) And, um, but I've done a lot of seminars with them and I'm actually an official mentor with um, YPY Monaco that is uh, the home of my um, honorary membership. And um, I love working with them. Um, Super Yacht Society also works very closely with YPY, as does Seakeeper Society. So again, this gives you an idea yeah, it's of a the family. interworkings of the industry. Because, um, you know, when you're, a, when you're working on board, um, they can become us. And the same thing with the, the people that are just getting into the business end of yachting. They become those of us that are helping um, lead and continue to grow the industry. Absolutely, and so that's um, that's super important to me. And I'm really proud to say that uh, several of the people that I have actively mentored um, have become incredible leaders um, in the industry, have started their own businesses, and accomplished great things. And of course, then I expect them to come back and support the things that are important to me, Absolutely. including. Um, the activities that we do at the International Sea Keepers Society. So I will. What I will do is I will take the ideas and the representation of the board of directors, and I'll walk into the boardroom, and I'm able to do business with people that I have mentored, people that I have known for decades, and come up with more creative ideas and more ways in which the yachting industry can give back to the world. All right. So, what would you recommend for somebody that wants to assist? They want to be a part of growing in the, the yachting industry in this way. So where would somebody follow you or find places to contribute to these organizations? What would be your recommendation? Volunteer. Okay. Volunteering is good for the soul. That's actually how I met my husband. I was volunteering at the Newport Music Festival, providing meals for the artists in the dorm when oh, he wow. sang his U.S. debut. And uh, that was 30 years ago. Now we've been married for 26 years. And so I'm telling you, volunteering is great for every aspect <laughs> of life. Anything can come from volunteering. Um, but I told you earlier that um, I joined the International Super Yacht Society mm-hmm. when it started almost 30 years ago. That gave me the opportunity to personally know the leaders of the business of yachting. So I can walk into a shipyard and I will know the owners, the managing directors by name. They know me. So therefore, I can get into their offices and I can discuss whatever's up, whether it's an educational conference, whether it's doing an interview um, to write a a profile of someone, Mm -hmm. um, or whether it's coming up with ideas for educational opportunities. Um, I tell my clients um, that I'm talking to about doing a business development and marketing, which is my specialty nowadays in consulting. And um, there's a a couple of things that I always say, you know, I'll, I'll give you some free advice. And uh, the number one that I say is join groups that you feel connected to and feel powerful about. Um, Because um, I think it's absolutely true that one of the best ways to achieve business success in yachting is through your causes. Because you have something in common with these people. You have something that that you feel passionate with. The business leaders in yachting today Yachting suffers from absolutely terrible uh, reputational issues. 
we all know that there's no getting around it. It doesn't get any better. Um, you know, we, we, you know, at the same time that we are on, um, you know, used on commercials for everything nowadays, um, every single time, you know, you see um, articles about uh, what's happening in, in businesses that are involved with, you know, large luxury items. Something often derogatory is mentioned about the yachting industry, but the reality is that we're an opportunity to do very powerful things. And in fact, we do mm -hmm. very powerful, important things, in particular regarding um, anything that has to do with bettering the state and the awareness of the importance of Mother Ocean. Mother Ocean, it always comes back to her. All right, so we'll leave with this. You mentioned that it's the best place to have dinner in Monaco, and I don't want you to reveal that because then you can't get in there, right? So where is the second best place to have dinner in Monaco? Well, you know, we're all going to have trouble at the Monaco Yacht Show <laughs> this year <laughs> because the very famous and always popular Stars and Bars has just closed. Oh. So no more uh, hamburgers and French fries and no more fantastic second floor meeting room at Stars and Bars. So we've all been scrambling a little bit. Um, but I have to tell you, if I'm not invited to, you know, lunch or dinner at the Yacht Club of Monaco, you know, which has that fantastic view and, you know, that's really great people watching and oh, really sure. great elbow rubbing. Um, I, my personal favorite uh, on the waterfront is Quai des Artistes. Um, it's a restaurant that's been there for many, many mm -hmm. decades. And uh, the food there is fantastic. Um, I highly recommend their um, burrata and tomato salad. Okay. <laughs> what do we hear to hear first? Is there anything else that you want to tell the industry before we wrap it up? Follow your heart. Mm. Stay in the yachting world. Make sure that you consider and take advantage of the really fantastic business opportunities that are there for everyone who wants to contribute that is looking to stay in the business because... Honestly, I think I'm in as good a position as anybody to say there is nothing much better than working in the yachting world, whether aboard or ashore. So stay with us, would you? I love it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this meeting at Boyd Insider. If you have any questions, we'll give you all of Norma's contact information and where to find her. Um, thank you. This has been amazing. Oh, thank you, Rianne. And it's been a real pleasure. I really like what you guys do. Um, you know, your outreach with your podcast in addition to your really interesting business. So I think one day I should be interviewing you as well. I'm down. <laughs> we'll make it happen. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye.